Today we're going to jump back into Mark, and, uh, and I want to, before we do that, I don't want to just kind of go in, uh, splash of cold water. I, I want to take a few minutes, because there's a lot of new people here. Maybe you came over the summer, or maybe this is your first introduction to Foothill Church as you come back to school or whatever, and I thought I want to take a few minutes and help you understand why we do what we do a little bit. Um, because some of you, this is going to be new, uh, what I'm going to explain to you, and, and others, you're like, no, done this all my life, and for others, you've been at Foothill Church, and, and for you, this is getting back to normal. This is just sort of... Uh, a, a sigh of relief. Second Timothy chapter four, verse two, Paul's talking to his young protege, Timothy, and he says to him, Timothy, preach the word. And then he tells him why, because there's coming a time when people are gonna gather to themselves these, these men who will tickle their ears and will say what they want to hear, which is not necessarily the same thing as what we need to hear. And so he says, Timothy, preach it, because if we don't do this, Timothy, then what's going to be happen is we're going to be tempted to run off and only talk about those things that we want to talk about. Again, not necessarily what we need to talk about. So, so at Foothill Church, we, we occasionally will preach a topical sermon based on some kind of felt need that we as a staff look around and say, hey, this is really a big need right now. So we preach a series on, we called Real Marriage off of Mark and Grace Driscoll's book and, and because we sense that, you know, there's, there's just a real need in our, in our congregation to help bolster and, 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 you know, help marriages be stronger. Last week's sermon, I talked about gospel community and the, the need we have to be in community with other believers in a local church and what God wants to do in our hearts through that. And if, if, so if we say since there's a need or, or, or the season leads us there, then, then we'll go ahead and we'll preach a topical sermon. But that's not normal for us, okay? And I want to explain what is normal because for the last five and a half years, uh, we have spent the majority of our time just walking through uh, books of the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, Okay, so you're not going to hear, you know, we're not going to, I'm not going to give you a five ways to manage stress in your life or whatever. We're going to try to look and see what does scripture say about this or that. So we've been through Ephesians, Ruth, Song of Solomon, 1 John, James, parts of Exodus, uh, and now we're in the book of Mark. Uh, and so why do we do it this way? And so let me just say, well, I think there's a lot of reasons, and I'm going to give you some reasons, but, but the chief reason we do this is that we feel this is God's priority for us. This is what God wants us to do as a church. It is one of our core values, I think we could say it that way. Expositional preaching. Okay, what is expositional preaching? You can, you can exposit anything. It's simply a matter of I want to take and fully explain as best I can in the time we have what's going on in the text of Scripture. And, and, it, and it's something we feel so strongly about that, listen, as long as I'm pastor of Foothill Church, I can tell you this is going to be a steady part of our diet is just expositional preaching. But, but we also do it because we believe it's beneficial. I wouldn't do this if I didn't think this was a benefit to me and to you, to the people of God. Uh, in fact, I think it's one of the most beneficial things we can do is to sit under and listen regularly and discipline ourselves to listen to the preached word of God. Okay, so, so let me just give you really quickly some reasons of why you want to do this. Foothill Church may not be your home. You may be checking us out today and trying to decide. And so listen, I think I've said this a thousand times since I got here five years ago. We're not for everyone. I get that. And, and if you find another church, great, go be a part of it, plug in, be committed, love those people. So, so I'm going to kind of help you understand who we are. And you may go, no, nope, not for me. Or some of you may go, no, that is. That is what I want. And so if you, if you like it, then come play. If you don't, then go find another place to play. Okay, so, so what are the benefits of expository preaching? Why do we do this? Well, number one, it forces us to learn all of Scripture, not just topics that interest us. Okay, and that's really important. We want to learn all of Scripture. We want to immerse ourselves in all of Scripture, not just, hey, you know, right now I kind of feel like I'd like to know some more about this, and I'm going to go to the text and try to, try to make it say what I want to say. Number two, it helps Christians study their Bibles. So I think the fact that we, that we get up and, and we say, let's just keep going, and you know that, hey, today we're in chapter 11, verse 27 to 33, and next week we're going to be in chapter 12, verse you know, 1 to 12. I mean, so, so you can follow along, and you can get ready, and you can be studying, and we can do this together. And so, so Christians, it helps you to study your Bible and to stay committed to that. Number three, it helps new Christians follow along in their Bible. Because look, you know, what we don't do a whole lot of here is like, okay, let's turn to Exodus. Now turn back to Habakkuk and Micah or whatever. Let's go to Luke. And, and, and they're trying to fumble through their Bibles. Like, look, I, I don't have the tabs. I don't know where this is. I can't find this, 
right? I, I've got my iPad, but I'm not even sure how to spell Habakkuk, right? So, so I, can say, I can say, let's look at chapter 11, verses 27 to 33, and you follow along. Let's do this together. And, and so, so they, can, they can begin to participate. I mean, some of you come from backgrounds where you didn't ever even read the Bible. And, and this is a brand new thing for you, and it's life-changing, Number four, all of Scripture is God-breathed, we're told. And it is profitable. And it's profitable, and that's why we should examine it. It's profitable. It, you know, sometimes it rebukes us, it corrects us, it encourages us, it trains us. This is what the Bible says it does. So we get into Scripture, and this is what it will do for you. And number five, it helps people see the Bible as a whole, and Jesus is the hero. Okay? Like, you understand this. Jesus not David, not Moses, not Abraham, not Paul. Jesus is the hero of Scripture. All of the Old Testament points forward to him. The Gospels look at him. Everything after the Gospels point back to him. It's all about Jesus, and it's one big story about his redemptive work, his salvation, the greatness of who Jesus is. Okay, And so we get to see that as we preach through Scripture like that. So we don't just do this because, okay? We do it because we are firmly convinced by Scripture and by experience that when the Word of God is properly preached, the voice of God is truly heard. And, and, and listen, if you want to know, if this is at all interesting to you, want to know what has been the greatest source of my personal spiritual growth in Christ, it's preaching. And I'm not talking about me preaching to you. I'm talking about me listening to men exposit the teachings of Scripture. It has absolutely changed my life. I grew up in an environment where, where basically it was all topical. Okay, so somebody would like, hey, we're going to talk about whatever, and I'm going to take a verse, and okay, that's good. We've kind of now supported ourselves scripturally. Now let me get off into what I want to talk about. And so Scripture becomes sort of this, this byproduct, you know, this, something that just, just helps us get where we want to go. And, and, and when somebody finally said, hey, let's open up Scripture and let's start walking through it together, it, it just rocked me. I mean, it was something that absolutely transformed my life. I was undone by it. See, I, and let me tell you, I, I got to be honest with you. I, um, I have nothing to say to you. That might surprise some of you. I don't. I have nothing to say to you. I, I, I'm, uh, I would be a terrible motivational speaker. Because I, I, I wouldn't even know what to, where to start. Like, you know, what, what do you say? I mean, because I don't have anything to say outside of what the Bible has already said. I, I'm just not that creative. I'm not that original. But I don't think God called me to be original. I think what God called me to do is say, give you this, feed you the word of God, preach the word. And sometimes originality can stand in the way of just the simple preached word of God. That will transform your life. <laughs> See, you know what you and I need to hear over and over and over again in our lives as Christians. And if you're not a Christian, this is what will save you. You need to hear, thus saith the Lord. This is what God's saying. Um, and I can't say that apart from opening our Bible. So let's just walk through this. See, some of you are like that. Look, I, I believe, so, so don't hear me. I, I really believe that people can hear from God. I believe that in your, in your prayer life, and, 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 and God may speak to some of you, but here's the thing. Here's what I do know about any of that. You can never be sure. It's an act of faith to go, God spoke to me. Okay, let me tell you something. When we open up the word of God, I can tell you without question, without reservation, Thus saith the Lord, God just spoke to you. It's the only way for sure that you can know that God is speaking is when we open up the scripture. So we preach expositionally so we can say, listen, listen up. Here's what Jesus is saying to you as a church, us as a church, and us individually. See, see, some of you come to me, I've heard you, you're, you've, you've, you've emailed me or whatever, and I'll say something like, you know, man, how did you know what was going on in my life? You know, or uh, were, you were looking right at me when you said, or that, that message was for me. Okay, God is my witness. If I looked at you, I swear to you, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to nail her on this one. Hannah, it's just for you, right? Okay, I mean, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not thinking that. 
Uh, it, it, is, it is, this is the word of God. And, and for some crazy reason, you can be preaching on propitiation and, and you can be preaching on, on predestination and you're hearing something about your dating life that God is convicting you about. That's the power of the word of God. It says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now just think of that image. That is a violent image. See, it didn't say sharper than, a, than, you know, than an antiseptic scalpel. He said a sword, a two-edged sword. I just cut you. And he says it cuts down to the marrow. I mean, right to the heart of things where you go, I didn't want to be laid open like that. And it did it. That's the word of God. It's that powerful. I don't look through your garbage and try to figure out what's going in the church, you know, and creep through the windows and like, oh, I know what's happening in your house. I don't. I'm just saying, if you preach the word of God, God does things that I could never do. And so we got to submit to that. And, 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 and I want to encourage you, wherever your church is, be regularly immersed in the preach word of God. Okay, so this is new to you. What we're doing, we just kind of go week by week. Welcome. Uh, if not, you're probably like, whew, glad we're back, okay? All right, so that's, that's kind of what we do, and I felt like that would be good before we just dive back in. And now let me, now let me just do something, because I want to try to bring you up to speed on where we are when we get to Mark chapter 11, verses 27 to 33, okay? And, and so that you have a little bit of context. Maybe you've not been with us since we started Mark, so I want to try to real quickly just give you some handles so that you sort of feel the flow, okay? You understand that the Gospels, the books of the Bible, are not just these patchwork quilts of random stories that people came up with, right? Like, oh, remember Jesus did that? Oh, yeah, let's stick that here. And oh, and he also did that. Well, let's put that there. And that's kind of how it feels sometimes. When you don't understand that there's actually a trajectory to this, there's actually a story, there's an arc, there's things that, that, that God is doing. These men were brilliant, but they were, they were inspired by God to write these things on the page, not just as patchwork stories, but to give a story. Okay, so the whole story of the book of Mark is answering the question, who is Jesus? Okay, now, we're readers, and if you've read the book of Mark, and if you haven't, you should, because literally it'll take you like 30, 45 minutes at max, depending on how fast a reader you are, okay? Sit down and read the book of Mark. What you're going to find out, you'll open up the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. We know who Jesus is because Mark tells us right up front, doesn't hold, pull any punches, doesn't hide anything from us. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is a loaded sentence, <laughs> The beginning, this is just the beginning because this thing goes on forever and it's the gospel. I mean, he has the audacity to say what I'm about to tell you is incredibly good news. And then he says, of Jesus Christ. Okay, we all, all these readers might know, yeah, I heard about that guy who's that Jewish, you know, miracle worker, whatever. And then he says, the, drops the bomb, the son of God. I'm telling you who he is right here. This is Jesus, this is the Christ, this is the Messiah and he is the son of God. And now, then he's going to launch into basically eight chapters, from chapter one to chapter middle of chapter eight, where he's going to say, I want to demonstrate to you that he is who I just told you who he is. So you're going to see all kinds, from chapter one all the way to chapter eight, verse 30, you're going to see all kinds of miracles, right? Jesus is going to stand up and tell a storm to shut up, and it's going to boom, just get calm. He's going he's gonna to heal people to walk up to him. You know, man with leprosy, whoosh, clean. He's going he's gonna to go to a little girl and say, you know, Talitha Kumi, little girl, arise. And she stands up. She's, she resurrects. She comes back to, to, to life, right? He's going to take the woman with the issue of blood. She touches his garment. Boom. I mean, all these miracles over and over again. Demons fleeing because he is who he says he is. And so the whole point of that is the demonstration of Jesus. And the, the second section goes from about... Mark chapter 8, verse 31 through chapter 10. And the whole point there is not to demonstrate, but to clarify. Clarify who Jesus is. So he's going to say, okay, you see, he's not just some magic worker. Uh, we want to make sure you understand what this means that he is this Christ. He is the Son of God. And the Son of God came to die. And so three times in that middle section, Jesus is going to predict his death. I'm going to Jerusalem. Guys, here's where we're going. And the chiefs and the elders and the priests, they're going to persecute me. They're going to spit on me, flog me. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be hung. I'm going to you know, go to a cross, die, and resurrect after three days. And they're all like, what are you talking about? He's trying to clarify them for them what, what what it means to be the messiah he tries to clarify for them what it means to be a disciple what it means to follow jesus and he says that comes at a cost 
Okay, it's not just I hitch my wagon to your train and woohoo, it's gonna be a great time. He says, you're gonna, you're gonna suffer. And the last section goes from chapter 11, which we're in now, all the way to chapter 16, verse eight, where, where Mark is now going to prove that Jesus is Christ. So this has most of Jesus' teaching and it ends with the greatest proof, the empty tomb. And by the time you get to Mark chapter 16, verse eight, you're basically left with a question. What are you gonna do with the empty tomb? What do you do with this? Who is Jesus? Okay, so up until chapter 11, we have about three years of Jesus' life and beginning in chapter 11, we start the final week of his life. Okay, from chapter 11 to chapter 16 is seven days, or you know, roughly, right? So, so it's like, it's, it's, it's the last week of his life. So this narrative has just been barreling along through three years, and then boom, it slows down for the last third and says this is his, this is his final week. So we're somewhere around Tuesday in today's, uh, in what we're looking at today. But I mean, so the next few months as I preach through the, the rest of the, 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 the gospel of Mark, um, just know we're, you know, it's going to take us several months, but it's a week. It's kind of like, just think of it like a season of 24, right? Every, every day is an hour, okay? So, and what we've seen so far is that Jesus, in chapter 11, goes to the temple. First time he goes and kind of surveys it like a general in his army. The second time he goes and ransacks it. Goes in, right, turns over tables. I mean, just causes this commotion. My house shall be called a house of prayer. You've turned into a den of iniquity, a den of thieves, and so when we pick it up in chapter 11, verse 27, we're back in the temple for the third time, okay? And the whole point of this section is Jesus's authority. And so let me try to unpack that for you today. Let's start reading in, uh, in verse 27, okay? And they came, again, this is Jesus and his, and his, and his disciples, to Jerusalem, and he was walking in the temple. And as he's walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders came to him. Now stop there, because I want you to remember what happened last time Jesus was in the temple. Okay, this was a bold day for Jesus. He overturns ta tables. He gets really angry. He's angry at sin. He's angry at hypocrisy. He's angry at how the people of God, the so-called people of God, are treating those who are not the people of God. They're, 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 it's the, you know, the way the people of God treat the non-Christians, if you will. Will. You know, we're going to leave the, the, the worst place in the temple for them. We get the best place. We get to be closest to Jesus. And it makes him very angry at how this, this whole affair is going on, how, how, how people were being treated and how this sin was happening and how this whole thing had become this commercialized center. And in chapter 11, verse 18, it says the religious leaders were so upset that they were looking for a way to destroy him. This is how mad Jesus made them by what he did uh, the previous day. And now look what happens. Here comes Jesus. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know that if I knew there were people out to destroy me, right? We want to shoot Chris, that I'm going to go back to the guys with the guns. Do you see this? This is amazing. He, he doesn't just go to Jerusalem and sort of skulk around in the shadows. He goes straight to the temple. He confronts these guys head on. He has to know what, he knows what's coming. He's already said, I'm going to Jerusalem. That's where I'm gonna die. At the hands of the chief priests and the elders. These are the men who will ultimately kill me. He had stirred up a hornet's nest the day before and he, he had straight back into the nest. Now what I want you to see there is this incredible courage of Jesus. Uh, you, you, we got to get this cultural painting of Jesus out of our heads. I mean, Jesus is a man. Jesus, listen, I, whether he felt fear or not, I don't know. But courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing what's right even when you're afraid. And he knows this is the last week of his life, and he knows they're going to take his life, and yet he still goes, and he still confronts them. You ready to do this, guys? See, how different from this cultural picture of Jesus as this milky-skinned, Galilean, feather-haired, you know, feminine, manicured nails, sky-blue sash over a white robe that never looks dirty and always holding his hands out and saying really nice things like, I love you all. 
I mean, the picture Mark paints is he's a dude. He's a man. He has authority, and he isn't going to back down because these religious leaders don't like it, and they feel threatened. I love this about Jesus. You know, we talk about him as a carpenter. Listen, have you, have you, I've never met a carpenter or shook the hand of a carpenter whose hands feel like the picture most of us see of Jesus. Like, wow, you work in the office, right? Have you ever felt the carpenter's hands? They're, you know, they're, they're like an inch thicker than everybody else's. They're like grip of steel. Feels like you're rubbing sandpaper. They're men. And, and I just like, wow. I mean, look, and, and listen, by the way, just so you're clear, uh, some of you are going to go to Israel with us next year, and um, a, a carpenter doesn't mean woodworker. There's no wood in Israel. It's, it's stone. He was a stonemason. Now, 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 he's doing some heavy lifting. Look, he was, he walked several miles a day. I don't know anybody today that would be as in shape. I mean, Sean T, eat your heart out. This is not, this, this guy, he, he, he's a man. And, 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 and he has this courage. And, and I just, I, I say, I, I emphasize that because, man, we, we got to see Jesus like this. Not that he's not angry, he, but he's masculine. And so he walks straight into the temple and, and, and look who comes after him. He knew it, right? Here comes the chief priests, the scribes, the elders are part of this group of 70 probably called the Sanhedrin. This is the top brass. These are guys who, who you know, they, they, they wrote all the books. They spoke at all the big, you know, Christian conferences, whatever. They had the best education. They memorized massive portions of scripture. You know, they, they knew not only the finer points of the law. They knew all the footnotes that go with those. They're these nerdy, you know, they, 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 and they hated Jesus because the people loved him. And that threatened them. And they didn't say, like John the Baptist, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. They said, no, 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 he must be destroyed so, so that we don't lose our place. And so they try, <laughs> they try to go toe-to-toe with Jesus. Just not a good idea, by the way, okay? So, so watch this. Let's go in verse 28. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Like, who gave you this authority to do them? You hear the sarcasm, the anger, like, you know, who are you? You're not the boss of us. You're not the guy that can tell us what to do. And Jesus says to them, I'll ask you one question. Answer me, and I'll, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man Answer me. Now, and now imagine the scene here. Okay, they are mad because of what he did in the temple the day before. It's Passover week, which means that the city of Jerusalem is just bursting at the seams with people. Okay, I mean, this is when all the pilgrims would come back into town, and, and this is the time for the party leaders to shine. Like, we've been waiting for this time all year. This is when the crowds at church get massive, and I'm so excited. I get to be on stage, and people are going to love me. This is our big moment. Everyone is here. Everyone is watching, and Jesus is taking the limelight, and they hate it. I mean, it's be like Mitt Romney showing up at the DNC last week, and nobody paying attention to Barack Obama, right? And everybody's like, well, hey, this is for him, not you. So, so they ask one of the guys, apparently, to come and ask him a question. Hey, hey go ask Jesus this. We've, we've thought about this. We pow out about that, right? Hey, you know what we should do? We should, we should say, uh, you know, what's a really good question that'll catch him? And man, it'll, it'll, it'll make it politically very difficult for him. And we'll, we'll destroy his reputation and we'll get to him that way. And so they come up with this and, and, and they, they hunker down and, and they come and they, they ask a question. <laughs> And I think Jesus, I don't know, who knows? I, I kind of like to think of Jesus just sort of looking at him like, Real, you guys want to do this? Because here we go, right? You know, smirking, like this is awesome. Here we go. All right, guys, as long as we're asking a question, let me ask you a question. And then he asked him, was John's baptism from heaven or from man? Now, what's he talking about? Well, remember John the Baptist Back in chapter 1, 2, um, he was this wild guy, right? He, he ate locusts and wore animal skins, and he was out in the wilderness, and everybody's going wildly popular. 
bold, gutsy guy, telling people to repent. I mean, just, just giving it to them and they would just come by the droves and he's baptizing them. And, and then one day Jesus comes and, and he's baptized by John. And when he comes up out of the Jordan River, right, he comes, he's under the water, he comes up out of the water and, and, and he hears a voice saying, this is my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Now, by the way, we're going to do a baptism service in a couple of weeks. And and, and listen, the best reason I can give, if you've not been baptized following your salvation, you should be. And, and you know, I could give you all kinds of reasons biblically you should do this, but you know the best reason is? Jesus got baptized. And Jesus said his disciples would do the same. And so if you want to be like Jesus and you want to be obedient to Jesus, you want to be a disciple of Jesus, get baptized in two weeks, okay? Enough. All right, so, so what Jesus is saying is this. Okay, hey, hey, guys, do you remember that day back in the Jordan River when, when you heard the voice from heaven? Was that from man or from God? Heaven, he was being a good Jew. He didn't say the name God very often. And, and so he, he says, was that from man or was that from God? And so he answers their question about authority with a question about authority. It's all about authority. In other words, Jesus goes, I don't owe you an explanation. I'm not your student. You're not gonna school me. I don't derive my authority from anyone. I am the authority. And in fact, that's one of the things that you'll see in the book of Mark that continually amazed people. I mean, just trace the, the word authority through the book of Mark and this idea. And, and you'll see there, you know, very early on, chapter 1, verse 22, they're astonished. He teaches with one like a, that has authority. They never heard this before. Usually they're referencing some of their rabbi and some of their footnotes and some of their book. He's just going, no, I'm just talking about me. He healed, right? He, 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 and had authority over demons, and he, he, he had authority to forgive sins. I mean, over and over we see the authority, and it just astonishes people. I mean, let's say it this way. If Jesus is God, and God came to walk among us, then I think we'd all agree there's no higher authority, right? I mean, if God showed up visibly in this room, I think we'd all be like, hey, we know who's in charge, right? It's you, not us. And I think Jesus is getting perturbed at this point, right? I, I think he's angry. And you look at the end of verse 30, in fact, and notice this. He says, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And then it says, and in the Greek, this is very emphatic, answer me, right? I mean, you can hear the authority in his voice. Was this from God or from man? You answer me. Uh, uh, he's not going to be pushed around by anyone. He is totally in charge. Now, let's keep going. Verse 31. And they discussed it with one another, saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say, then why, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, they were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. See, so, so they start deliberating, right? They're like, okay, let's talk. Guys, huddle, huddle. Oh, crap. Did you hear what he just said? I have no idea how we get out of this, right? If we say, if we say uh, it's from heaven, then we're jacked because then we're supposed to do what God says. If we say from, from man, then all the people, we're going to be unpopular, and we fear the people. So what do they do? They do like good politicians, and they suddenly just go, we don't know. They become agnostic. <laughs> Look, I think they know. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced they know. I just don't think they want to admit it. Because see, the, the moment you admit that it's from heaven, that, that Jesus has authority, is the moment you're accountable. It's the moment you got to go, I'm accountable to you and you have authority and we have to do. So listen, here's what religious people do. Religious people say can can do they they can either say they're they're wrong and they can repent or they can seal themselves up in kind of their own uh, pride and refuse to repent that's what these guys do they won't admit they're wrong they'll just say i don't know and walk away and this is what some of you do So you know the truth. You know Jesus has authority. You, you, but you just don't want to admit it because as soon as you admit that to yourself, 
you're accountable. You're accountable to God. As soon as, soon as you do, you're going to have to say, Jesus, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me and turn from your ways and turn to Jesus and his ways. And many of us don't want to do that. And Jesus basically says, guys, if you're not willing to commit to me, I'm not going to commit to you. If you can't be honest enough to say to yourself, this ain't right, I'm wrong, oh my gosh, the light just went on, then, then look, you won't be honest with Jesus. And maybe you think, you know, well, yeah, but I like to keep an open mind. I mean, I, I like to keep, you know, I, I like to suspend judgment. There's a lot of gray in this world, Chris. And, 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 and what, you know, I, so I want to keep my options open. And what you call an open mind and what you call suspending judgment and all that, Jesus calls skepticism and unbelief and cowardice because you won't commit. So let me just... I want to ask you one question that I want you to ask, ask an answer to yourself. Do you believe Jesus has all authority? Do you believe that? Okay, that's what Jesus is after in these verses. This is what Jesus is after in my life. That's what he's after in your life. He's the authority. And when I ask, do you believe? I am not. I don't think scripture is asking us, do we confess something as true? Yeah, that's good that you confess that. I'm saying, do you live that way? Do you live as though Jesus has all authority in your life that is not to be questioned? See, does he have authority over your body? Does he have authority over your relationships? Does he have authority over your career? Does he have authority over your free time? Does he have authority over what you listen to? Does he have authority over your schooling? Does he have authority over what you put in front of your eyes? Does he have authority in your home? Does he have authority in your marriage? Does he have authority in who you will or won't date? And if the answer to those questions is, well, functionally, no, he doesn't have authority, then my question back to you is that in what way, then, does Jesus have authority in your life? How can you even say he has authority? You can't. You are a functional atheist, agnostic. I mean, let's, let's just talk really practically here. Some of you have things in your life, sins, whatever, and you know they're displeasing to Jesus. You know they are. And rather than submitting to him, you go, I don't know. I don't know. So I guess I'm justified in doing it because I don't know. There's a little gray, gray there, right? Or you just ignore it and you repress it so that you can do what you want to do and not have to bow your knee to Jesus' authority. So, so while you confess that Jesus has authority over your life, your functional authority is you. Now, there's a word for that. You know, some people want to call it narcissism. Whatever. That's idolatry. And listen, let me just tell you something. There's a lot of ways we can talk about what it means to be a Christian, but this has to be one of the foundational ways. Being a Christian is when I stop being my own highest authority, when I come off the throne of my life and Jesus gets put there. When I bow my knee, not to the man in the mirror, but I bow my knee to Jesus Christ. And so what it means is that if Jesus commands, we salute and obey. If he says, do it, we do it. If he says, stop it, we stop it. If he says, believe it, we believe it. If he says, that's nonsense, 
It's nonsense. See, look it. I want to operate this way as a church. I, I, I want this to be, we, we, listen, we, we're seeking to be obedient to Christ. Jesus, our highest authority. Jesus, our senior pastor. And if he says, believe this, we want to believe it. If he says, do this, we want to do it. And I'm not saying we do this perfectly. I'm saying our highest goal is to listen to Jesus and obey him and salute him without question. And if you find you're in disagreement with Jesus, you don't argue with him. Argue with me, fine. Argue with somebody. Don't argue with Jesus. You repent and you agree with him. You don't say, well, I don't know, and walk away. You change your mind and you say, unlike these guys. I mean, how, what a different story this would be if they were like, oh my gosh, he just got us. Guys, he's right. We're wrong. Jesus, we're sorry. That's what you do. See, see, you know, this is the Christian life. Okay, I think you all know the name Martin Luther, right? He nails, he starts off, you know, kicks off the, the Reformation and, and uh, by nailing his 95 theses to the Wittenberg door. And, 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 uh, and have you ever read those? The very, very first theses says this. It says, when our Lord... And master, Jesus Christ said, repent. He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. You, you, you ought to put that somewhere. <laughs> the entire life. Like, look, what's repentance? I'm wrong. Jesus is right. On whatever issue. If, I'm, if I find myself out of sync with Jesus, he's right, I'm wrong. And so the way you rectify that is repentance. I recognize Jesus has all authority, not me. You recognize Jesus has all authority, not you. It means you worship Jesus, no one, nothing else. And the reason the entire life of believers is one of repentance is that we all sin. First John, right? If we say we have no sin, we're liars, but if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Isn't that great hope? <laughs> because you know the fact of the matter is, um, you know, this might be crazy for you to think. I sin a lot. I sinned this week. I sinned yesterday. I sinned this morning. I'm not telling you this I'm proud of. I'm saying this is, and you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm so sinful, I don't realize I'm sinful. But when Jesus shows me I'm wrong, I don't want to excuse it. I don't want to ignore it. I don't want to say, I don't know. I want to repent. I want to admit I'm wrong and he's right. You see, what Jesus is saying is that all authority is bound up in him. He's God's son. All authority, says Matthew 28, right? In heaven is given to me. It's not, authority is not bound up in religion. Authority is not bound up in a temple. Authority is not bound up in a pastor or priest. It's all in Jesus. He has authority. So we don't go to a temple now. We, we, don't go, we, we, we don't go to a place and say, if I, I, I got to be closer to Jesus. Like you, you, One of the saddest things about going to Israel is all these Jews who believe that if they'll get up there and write their little prayer on a piece of paper and stick it in the wall, that somehow I'm closer to God because now I'm closer to the temple. And that is pagan. It is so sad to see because Jesus tore the temple open. I mean, the great news of Christianity is we don't have to do that anymore. We get to be near God because of Jesus. I don't have to go to Israel and go, now I feel near Jesus. I don't have to make a pilgrimage somewhere. <laughs> I got, Jesus did it and said, I'm going to draw you near through my blood. This is the great news of the gospel. I don't have to go to a temple. So why do we get together, Chris? And why are we here? Listen, we're not here. Because God is, you know, this is where we get near to God. And then when you, you know, the further you get away from here, then, you know, the signal gets dimmer and dimmer. No, you know why you come together? Because over and over the Bible commands us to come together. Because over and over the Bible is going to tell us that when we do this, 
This is when we know the fullness of the Spirit. Because, right, I don't, I don't, you don't, we don't, like, none of us in this room have all the gifts of the Spirit. Not one. And any gift of the Spirit you have, God put in you for me, and any gift of the Spirit I have, God put in me for you. Like, I would be declared clinically insane if I just went in my closet and started preaching to myself. You're like, what is he doing? That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. This is how some of you treat your gifts. The reason we come together, the reason we do this body of Christ thing, there's something really powerful about this. It's not, hey, leave the doors of Foothill Church open during the week because when I come in and I see the stained glass windows and I rub up against them, God is here. (laughs) No, 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 he's not. No, God is here with us, the people of God, coming to glorify Jesus, disciplined about it, making it a regular part of our diet. That's why we do it. So we don't center our worship on a place, we center it on a person, right? We gather as the people of God, filled with the Spirit to worship Jesus, and as we gather together, we invite those who don't know Jesus to come in. Come, come experience the fullness of God's spirit. And listen, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, oh man, I want you to. <laughs> you need to. I'm not talking about you don't know about him. If you're American, you know the name Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. Do you know that Jesus loves you? Do you know you can have a personal relationship with Jesus? Do you know you can be part of a family of God through Jesus? Do you know you can be brought near to God through Jesus? Do you, do you understand this? And if you're here today and you don't know him in that way, I don't want anything from you. Seriously, I want something for you. We want something for you. As a church, we want you to know Jesus like we know him. We want you to know that nearness, that fullness of his spirit. We want you to know forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and friendship with God. That's what I want for you. Jesus has authority. The question is not whether he has it. It's whether you recognize it and whether you live like that's true. Let's pray. Father, um, I I thank you so much that we, we serve a God who has authority over all. Presidents will rise and fall and Jesus will stay on the throne. That's where our hope is. That is such a balm, warm blanket for my soul to know that you are sovereignly ruling over everything. And Father, we, we want to do more than give you lip service about your authority in Jesus. We, 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 Jesus, we want, to, we want to live that way. So help us, God. Help us. That's going to be by your grace. And so I pray, God, let us live out that grace. Let us, live, let us live as though it were true that you have authority in our lives, authority in our marriages, authority in our relationships. God, we, we answer to you. We obey you. We respond to you immediately. Help us, Jesus. And God, I pray for anybody who's here this morning that, that doesn't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God, open their eyes. Convict them of sin and unrighteousness so that they turn and run to you, seeing you with open arms. Not angry, not tapping your foot, not a furrowed brow, but a smile and a laugh and open arms ready to welcome them. Do it, I pray, today as they confess their sin and turn to you. In Jesus' name.